please welcome Matt Love. Um, thank you, Don, for that introduction. And um, the last time I was here, um, students were playing War Pigs by Black Sabbath yes. on that very stage. And it was loud, and it was good. <laughs> Um, I missed that job at Newport. I want to thank Don for um, getting me a house here. I've been, I came in Friday night, and I spent, I think, two of the most productive days I've had in a year uh, in Yahats, just thinking, writing. I saw a coyote on the beach this morning at Patterson. He looked right at me. I didn't divine any message from him. Uh, there's about 17 driftwood forts at Patterson. You should go check them out. It's one of the greatest complexes I've ever seen on the coast. There is a master fort maker in that area, whoever it is. So thank you, John, for having me. Yahats, this is just a wonderful community. And in the coming months, you'll probably read a few columns about this place. I'm excited um, to see some old friends and some former students from Newport High School, including you used to, Elena Sutton used to be in my band and played on that very stage right here a few years ago. So it's good to see you. Um, the program tonight is called One Writer's Muse, The Oregon Coast, and it's, I have some slides, I'm going to read from one of the books, I have an excerpt, um, perhaps I'm going to read from the new book, though I, I no longer know where it is, um, but um, then we'll have a little Q&A and then get you out into the world uh, tonight and enjoy this fine evening in, in Yonhats. I think my story really begins when I was 33 years old and living in Portland, Oregon, and teaching at Hillsboro High School. And I owned a loft in the Pearl District uh, that I bought for $50,000 in the early 90s. And I was dead as a, as a person. Um, I had always wanted to be a writer, it, nothing was happening. So I moved to the coast to take a teaching job, and there I met the beach, and I met the ocean, and everything began to change for me. And now I was supposed to stay down here for one year. It was going to be a one year cultural experiment. I'm on my 18th year on the Oregon coast. Uh, I'm up in Astoria now, and I don't think I'll ever leave because I found something that um, inspired creativity and passion, and it begins here at the beach. I moved down here. This is an extraordinary set of photographs. Um, I encountered this set of sculptures uh, down by South Beach a couple years ago. I went down there in the late evening and there wasn't one structure. I came down at dawn, because I like to get up early. There, this installation had been made overnight. The sea god. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, what was this? I mean, these things were, I went over to kick one of them down, and they were anchored. Okay, somebody put purpose, intent. I walked into this, and this is, and I remember writing a column about it, and somebody uh, wrote me back a 2,000 word single spaced email. <laughs> you walked into Satan's lair. <laughs> then I showed this photograph at my students at Newport High School, and one kid gave me a one word answer meth. <laughs> so, who knows? Maybe a combination of both. This stuff, when I moved down here, this is what began to happen to me. When I would go to the beach multiple times a day, living near Pacific City, then South Beach, and now even in uh, Astoria. I mean, look at that. Wonder. And then the tide took it away. So it was an ephemeral piece of art that inspired me. Um, my dog. Take finding dogs and then rescuing dogs and going to the beach, getting my act together as a human being down there. She's still alive, almost 16. I, I would run into these people in moments of distress. It happens to me all the time because I go at odd hours and to beaches that are not populated. This, this guy, I thought he was going to kill himself. And he did not, he left, but he came back two consecutive days and was out there, and I call him the waiting man, and I see people down in, in distress all the time, and sometimes I've intervened and sometimes I haven't. Found this little dude. People making art. 
This is the subject of a column many of you may have read in the Oregon Coast today, this incredible tribute to this um, woo. I thought it was a dog. This article appeared, and the husband, um, the father of this child, she died of cancer at age nine, and this was his tribute uh, to her. So I, I just, it was, this is, was at uh, the beach of the South Jetty at uh, Mahalo Bay State Park. This kelp fountain somebody made. And I found out it was his grandparent, uh, a grandfather took his kids down and made this extraordinary kelp fountain. And you know, I started going to the beach and, and I traveled all over the world. And I'm like, why, why is it different here in Oregon? All the beaches are publicly owned. Access is guaranteed by law. I travel around the world, we have to pay. There's fences, there's security guards. I mean, you guys are nodding, some of you are nodding your heads, you know what I'm talking about. It's bracing. I got a $99 ticket up in Washington at Cape Disappointment from a, armed, uh, from a ranger has full body armor and wearing a clock because I didn't pay 10 bucks to go to the beach. It was bracing. That's Washington, right across the river. <laughs> We did it different. This is Oswald West, governor. He rode his horse called Fred the Freak over Mount Arch Cape and Mount Yakani in 1912 and then wrote a 66 word bill in 1913 that became law. It declared the wet sands beaches a public highway, which is what they were being used for in that era. It was a master stroke, didn't cost the taxpayers a cent and began the legacy of Oregon's publicly owned beaches that are just unrivaled in, in, in the United States and perhaps the world. I benefited from that when I came and found the beach in the state that it was. In 1967, there was a, a, a great controversy that was touched off by this motel, the Surf Sands Motel in Cannon Beach, where it was unknown who controlled or who owned the dry sands area beaches in Oregon. So the, the, the 1913 bill by Oz West protected the wet sands portion, but the dry sand portions, it, nobody really knew. So this motel owner um, kicked off an elderly couple um, picnicking there, and it touched off this epic legislative battle over the beach bill. This is Governor Tom McCall coming down during the middle of the session to try to get the bill moved to the full floor where it could be voted on. Bucking his own party, he was a Republican. Yes, there were Republican governors in Oregon long, long ago. Um, but if they, maybe another time, one day there will be again too. He came down here, the bill passed after nearly going under. If that bill hadn't passed in 1967, you wouldn't recognize the Oregon Coast today. The beachfront landowners would have moved out into the, almost to the edge of where the wet sands area. Riprap, boardwalks, fences, all of it. So this, those two laws are created this unique legacy and this recreational um, culture here of going to the beach. There's Governor McCall. So it's two terms. And then I found the story of this gentleman. So as I was going to the beach constantly, thinking, I began to write. It's like I found a voice right. as a writer the beaches, and the first story I really dug into is why they are the way they are in this state. What happened? I found the West story. I found the beach bill. Then I found this story. His name was Matt Kramer. He was a um, veteran reporter for the Associated Press that coined the phrase the beach bill. It was his writing in that inverted pyramid style with no opinion, which nobody writes like today in, in newspapers, that made a difference in saving the beaches. This particular article he wrote when the, um, the bill was, you know, it was, the death knell was ringing for it, and he wrote this, these articles, and people were galvanized, McCall gets involved, people get involved, and I found that an incredibly inspiring story, and Matt Kramer died from cancer in 1972, and the state erected a memorial to a journalist <laughs> in Oswald West State Park. I took you there. My job as a journalism teacher was to make sure every kid laid hands on this thing because what you could do with the power of writing straight news changed Oregon history. Once again, I benefited from his efforts. 
And I lived in Pacific, near Pacific City for uh, 10 years. I was the caretaker of a wildlife refuge, which was uh, the greatest charge of my life. Um, and I found this park that was named after an, uh, Oregon's former governor and also state treasurer, who in 1967 defeated the proposal, there he is, Bob Straub, to relocate Highway 101 down the Stucca Spit. Madness. Okay, this was the era where they were going to move Highway 101 and go down Neatart Spit. Okay, look up. They were going to go down Bay Ocean Spit. Now they couldn't go down Salishan Spit because there are already houses there. Yeah. But they wanted to move the highway closer to the beach so people could look at it when they're driving 55 miles an hour. <laughs> that was called recreation in 1965. Um, this now I found this story. It had never been written about. It had been mentioned in McCall's biography. I went to the state archives, State Department of Transportation archives. I was the first one to crack the seal on this thing. And inside is the story of the state treasurer, Bob Straub, being a complete badass for Oregon, going back to DC, taking on McCall, taking on all the power people. And he won. And I went down to the Stucca Spit probably 2,000 times when I was living in that area with the dogs, all sorts of magic happened there. It was saved for me to come and find later. And I derived inspiration from that. Politicians in Oregon in that era did these things. A journalist did this stuff. And I found these stories incredibly inspiring. And I began to develop a voice, sometimes hectoring, sometimes sort of funny, sometimes profane, um, sometimes just in utter astonishment of what, how we did it differently here. And that was the, the thing that was my first inspiration. The second was the bars on the Oregon coast. <laughs> the tavern life here. Now, when I was 21, I would go to these places in Portland. They weren't nearly as interesting because there wasn't working class fishermen and loggers hanging out in these places telling these stories, which I conveniently eavesdropped in all the time when I was there. The chart room in Astoria. Hoover's. Where one time, Steve, oh, this is a great story. Stevie Nick stopped in there with her brother, driving down from Seattle down to a concert in San Francisco. She stopped in at Hoover's. She sang a, um, a Fleetwood Mac karaoke song. The guy at the bar goes, Wow, she sounds really good. Sounds like a lot like Stevie Nicks. <laughs> and she was on her way. Those kind of stories that you find in these places, where someone would walk up to me and say, aren't you the guy that shot Randy Weaver, Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge? <laughs> no. <laughs> the Big O Saloon in Astoria. Just an incredible lager bar. The stories. The Bay Haven in Newport. Sight of something I like to read. Because I go to these places and I listen and I talk to these people and no one really has, had ever asked them what their stories were. And I like to record them. But this is one I'd like to share with you because I finally found out something. This is from my book, um, Sometimes a Great Movie, the filming of Sometimes a Great Notion in the summer of 1970. I'll share this with you. Not long after Ken Kesey died in 2001, I staged a wake for my hero by drinking beer in the Bay Haven, a tavern on Newport's Bayfront. There I noticed a, a, a poster of promotional stills from Sometimes a Great Notion, the movie, the movie. The adaptation of Kesey's great Oregon no novel was filmed in Lincoln County in the Central Oregon coast in the summer of 1970, incl including some scenes shot in the Bay Haven, which stood in for the snag saloon from the novel. Now who's seen the film? Raise your hand. Okay, it's a classic. We need to screen that down here, Don. I think that would be a great event here. I asked the bartender and a few other patrons if they had seen the movie. They all had. In fact, several had also read the novel. As we talked about the book and the movie, a thickly bearded man wearing a baseball cap emerged from the alcove, sheltering the video poker machines. He moved toward me told, holding a hands can and sat next to me at the bar. He said he had a story about Paul Newman, star of the movie. Would I like to hear it? Yes, I would. I ordered him another hands. He appeared anywhere from 40 to 80 years old. 
or what I call OTA, Oregon Tavern Age. <laughs> the story went, one rainy night in 1970, the man was drinking in a tavern in Toledo, eight miles east of Newport. In walked Paul Newman, carrying a chainsaw. <laughs> he was wearing a fake chest, said the man. The man explained that Newman wore some kind of padding under his shirt. He said it bulk up, because he's playing Hank Stamper. That Newman still wore the padding and carried the chainsaw, then he might have come right off location in and around Toledo where many scenes were filmed. Newman didn't say anything. The patrons recognized him because, well, you know, at the time he was the biggest movie star in the world. Okay? He fired up the chainsaw. <laughs> he sawed the legs off a pool table and sent the slate crashing to the floor. Newman left without saying a word. Oh, come on, you're bullshitting me, I said. I reminded of the scene from the movie where Newman's character enters a union office with a chainsaw and cuts up the, de the desk of the union official. I know that scene, he said. That was acting. I was in a bar in Toledo. Newman was there. He was drunk out of his mind. I have no reason to lie. I don't even know you. A few minutes later, he disappeared, and I never got his name. I didn't investigate that fantastic story back in 2001, but knew one day I would un er undertake a mission to discover if Paul Newman really did enact the greatest drinking story in Oregon history. <laughs> There's Ken Kesey. The movie came out in 71, did do really well. It's a cult film here in Oregon. There's the Stamper House on the Celettes. It's for sale, anybody? Half million dollars. There he is, in front of Moe's. Iconic photograph here. That's the co-producer of the film. Newman was 46 years old at the time. When I started researching the book, I came across all these stories about, oh, Paul Newman once took a chainsaw and cut up the desk of George Roy Hill, the director of Butch Cassidy and Sandman's Kid, over a dispute about a liquor tab. I also found out that Paul Newman once took a, an acetylene torch and cut a sports car in half of a producer that stiffed him on some kind of uh, bill. He was a practical joker and a binge drinker extraordinaire. Now, he, he stopped all of that later, but he was a madman in this era. Okay? So that pool table story, I started talking about that. I did a cable access show in Toledo, Oregon. Yes, I did a cable access show in Toledo, <laughs> Oregon. And it began airing, and people said, I get these emails, oh, Matt, yeah, I was in the bar. I was, it was in Kirkville. No, it was in Newport. No, it was in Toledo. <laughs> it was here, it was here, here. I just, one, one woman said, yeah, my dad was there. He had the, he had the leg of the pool table in our, our uh, den for years. <laughs> what was the story there? Look at Newman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to announce something tonight. I now know the story. What happened? And I'm going to entertain you with it right now. I've got a teacher friend at Scapoose High School. He was a fan of the book. I got this email this summer, last summer. Matt, I've got to tell you about a great notion encounter I had today. I was waiting at OHSU during an appointment, and the guy across from me mentioned that he was from Toledo. He's 52 and lived up there until a few years ago. He was nine when they filmed the movie. His mom was an autograph hound and got a chance to see Paul Newman. His version of the pool table story is that this occurred in a bar that is no longer there. Newman came in one night with a chainsaw, with a fake chain. <sighs> the legs on the table were pre-cut. <laughs> making it look like he could saw through them real fast. He said it is divided there among the old timers, the pool legs of the pool table. It was a setup. <laughs> so I conclusively proved the story, of course, until next year when somebody will write me something totally different <laughs> and the story will change. Of course, this scene, which they were both drunk out of their minds on shit as regal scotch during the production on that scene. There's Richard Jekyll with his stand-in holding the bottle of shit as regal that made the famous drowning scene actually work. 
Beaches, bars, bridges. This is Condi McCullough, Oregon's master bridge builder from 1919 till the late 1930s. His aesthetic is implanted on the Oregon coast. He is the builder of the Green Lady, as I dubbed it. This is from circa 1935. Look at that photograph. Jetty, all that area where we surf now today, it's completely, all the vegetation that's moved in, Jetty's really changed a lot on the Oregon coast. When I first moved to Newport, I mean, I wasn't, I started working, I lived in South Beach, and I drove across this thing every day. That's Miss Newport, 1948. <laughs> I began a relationship with a piece of architecture. I crossed it going to school in the morning. I walked it, I biked it. It changed my whole idea of what a bridge can be and the importance of good, beautiful architecture in our lives instead of building bridges like the I-205 Glenn Jackson super slab across the Columbia River, which is nothing, okay? Some of these photographs, most of them are from, and I wasn't even gonna write a book. I was writing the book about sometimes a great notion. Then all of a sudden, I started teaching photography again and we just started going to the bridge and talking about the bridge and writing about the bridge. And I heard all these bridge stories and, and people have a relationship to this thing as do the people in Florence with that beautiful Condi McCullough bridge. Okay, all the ones that are just up and down the coast. And I was intrigued by the story. They built those coastal masterpieces during the New Deal. They built them in less than two years. Under budget, they put people to work who were still using them today, and they had art. Their works of art under the bridges, the obelisks, all these things. I took about 2,000 photographs, usually driving across it. <laughs> I was armed in my truck. I had two film cameras, I had a fisheye, I had two digital cameras, and I was just <laughs> all the time. I couldn't stop in the rain. You took this photograph. Lady Sutton took this photograph. Give her a hand for this. I just can't remember this. This is the field trip. We took a field trip of 50 minutes to the bridge where a lot of the students at Newport High School had never been under it, or had never walked across it. So I made them go, and we had an incredible day that afternoon. Then I found the rain. Um, beaches, bars, bridges, and of course, those of you that live here year-round, rain is just ubiquitous. It's, it's, a, it's a motif, it's a character, it's an attitude, and um, I began to, to, to look at rain in a different way. Uh, the book was, I wrote about, it was called The Walking Rain, had an unusual genesis. Um, I, well, I didn't break up, I got dumped <laughs> in a relationship that I did not see coming, and my intuition had failed me, and I suffered from the worst bout of insomnia I've ever had, <clears throat> and I started walking in the rain at all hours, and, um, it completely changed my entire writing style. Those of you who read some of my earlier stuff, there is a dramatic shift in the rain book that has continued into the book about the jewel heist and Astoria and other stuff. And I don't know what happened, but I just began to look at it. And this is one of my favorite photographs. I think you're up there too again. Remember that field trip we took there? It rained 4.75 inches during the field trip. <laughs> <laughs> the moment we left Newport High School, Oswald West, rain, rain, rain. They started complaining and then there was a shift. Then it's like, we're going into it and we got a story. And that was, I, I just these, these, these stories with rain, of course I'm taking pictures of the rain and the bridge as well. And I began to see its powerful metaphors. And um, I changed as a teacher as well. I became less combative, more collaborative, which is what rain really is, it's a collaboration. I began to, to meander and um, less confrontations with students, that something was going wrong. And it, it just, it's difficult for me to explain by my book. <laughs> right there. I'm just looking at it. And I found driftwood forts. These are the things that inspired me here, that I felt like 
I was reading, I, I, was, I was seeing these things and walking into them, and they were just everywhere. Suddenly, here are all these forts that I'd seen for years, then I started seeing them. Well, who makes these? Adults. Kid didn't make that. Okay? This is at the South Jetty uh, at the Hilo Bay State Park, which is now the second greatest place to see driftwood forts. I'm now declaring Patterson that down there at the um, All Sea Bay is there was more, there were 17 forts there today. 17. You got to go. Look at these things. This is on Fort Stevens. Who builds them? Why? They only, they happen all up and down the Pacific Northwest Coast because the coast range is here, there's logging. Gotta have, no logging, no, not a lot of driftwood forts. You get some, but that, that brings the, the wood down and it's this eternal cycle. Then people build the forts, then they burn them in bonfires. Then the wood is gone and then it starts all over again. And I found that metaphor just beautiful and that people, collaborate on forts and then you leave and then somebody repurposes that it falls down somebody builds it up you leave it and you just improve it and you just keep moving on and you keep moving on and i've been writing a lot about this and i published a book by a young author named james herman called driftwood forts the oregon coast the book sold out it's already like a cult book and um people thought i was joking when i when i you know rhapsodized about this go build one and then we'll talk. It's fun. It's a workout. You're in the ocean. You're creating art and shelter. It's just this unique thing. This is a beachside from a couple years ago, State Park. Love that one. Look at that thing. That looks like a bunker. I built that one. Luckily, my dog has bad front feet, so she has to sit down. She's the perfect posy dog <laughs> for all my photographs. If you've seen the Oregon Coast Today column, she's, that's why. Most times, you can't get a dog to sit still to take a picture of her, right, when you're on the beach? But she manages to do that for me. Then I moved to Astoria, and I, I had a great run at Newport. Um, had some great interactions here. And I was on the beach with a couple friends, and we were building a driftwood fort, and I had an epiphany. I'm done with this town. I need to move. I need to find something else. I always wanted to move to this mighty city on the river that is just soaked in history. It's not a beach town, it's a river town. I still go to the beach about every other day, but it takes me about 15 minutes. And their bridge is just ugly. I call it a linebacker, <laughs> as opposed to the green lady. I mean, it just doesn't, you can't walk across it. They don't allow it. They built it with no pedestrian access. And these abutments just, Terrible. But beaches are nice there, Peter Otterdale. The column. The jetty there, mind blowing. I've been inspired by the jetty and the metaphor there of standing on this thing, trying to hold back the ocean to build a railroad into the sea, you dump the boulders to create a better channel for. Uh, uh, navigation on the, across the Columbia Bar, which was the graveyard of the Pacific. And, but yeah, it's falling apart. They're never gonna repair that. It's too expensive. And I'm up there, I'm thinking, you know what? The Great Pyramids are gonna last longer than the jetty on the Columbia River. Because the rain and the ocean, and it's just, if you haven't visited that spot, because people go to Astoria and they drink beer and that's it. Okay, <laughs> go to the jetty. So these stories came to me. I dug them up. I unearthed them. People presented them to me. And then I decided, I, how will I tell them? How will I find a readership? And years ago, um, I got very close on a big book deal for the memoir about caretaking the wildlife refuge. It was close. And then it didn't, then it just dissipated into the wind. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because if, those, if that had happened, I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't have had 600, well, almost 700 events around Oregon promoting the books. I wouldn't have met Mari, the Mari's books and had interactions and set a world record in her bookstore, which I'm gonna to explain today. Uh, since she opened that bookstore, I set a world record for a writer. And how do I phrase this? 
Every time I'm in the shop, there's a customer I don't know. I have never failed to sell a book in the store right there. <laughs> well, will you, will you uh, confirm? Yes, I will affirm it. Did you have it happen yesterday? Happened yesterday. <laughs> but I would have never met these just wonderful, uh, you know, book people who are, you know, surviving in this in this era. I call it the Stethoscope Press. My first book is kind of online, so it's sort of a guide to all these watering holes. Three quarters of them now are out of business if you go to this website, which is the nature of the coast, right? It's ephemeral. This was my first book about the um, legacy of Oregon's publicly owned beaches. That came out in 2003. It's a little strident, but that's who I was at the time. I'm not like that anymore. Then I published a book about the famous Oregon Rock Festival. <clears throat> which I just got an email the other day. Someone else has claimed responsibility for Vortex. It's just like the ocean story. <laughs> They're never over. Okay? That book is long out of print. I wrote a book about the Trailblazer too from 77. Secret weapon, marijuana, and Bill Walton. <laughs> the Sesquicentennial Anthology, celebrating Oregon's 150th birthday. Super Sunday in Newport. Just moved to that town and just was struck by the peculiar people that are in it. <laughs> um, the bridge. Um, there's a lot of writing about the fabulous students I had there that I, I miss dearly. My uh, experience of being the caretaker of a wildlife refuge. The story about loving the green lady, about the, the just the reaction of the people have to this bridge. And this woman put a tattoo of it on her chest. That's what people do that bridge. Now, you're not going to put a bridge, a tattoo of the Glenn Jackson Bridge on your, on your arm, okay? <laughs> then, of course, this book, The Walking in Rain title. I published the Driftwood Fourth book. I became a publisher of other people's stories, and I'm proud to announce that the next book that the Stethoscope Press is going to publish, well, my own story book is coming out in a couple weeks, but Lincoln County Commissioner Bill Hall has written a novel that we're gonna, I'm publishing. It's called McCallandia. It is a historical utopian fiction that posits Tom McCall became president of the United States, not Ronald Reagan, and there was an alternate better history of America. <laughs> and it's a fabulous book. When you see Bill, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of events, you support that book. You need to get him down here too. Um, it will be fantastic. Come, it should be out at the end of April. Roughly. Yeah, Don? We have Bill Hall scheduled to be here in May. Ah, uh, love it. <laughs> love it. And just, yes, there's a national vortex. There's a national beach bill. There's a national bottle bill. All these things that Oregon was renowned for in that McCall era then are transplanted to the national arena. Great book. This book, I've been busy with books. This one came out last summer. Um, for one day in the summer of 1993, I was a suspect in the biggest jewel heist in Oregon history. Once the statute of limitations were up, I decided to write a book about it. <laughs> Why not write a book telling that you may have pulled this off? It's the best way to, to um, you know, elude suspicion. This is the new book, a nice piece of Astoria. <laughs> And the Chamber of Commerce types in that story are not going to like this, so be it. The title comes from a gentleman, the second day I moved into Astoria, this gentleman walked up to me. He was wearing um, a hoodie that said Robert E. Lee Window Washing Service. <laughs> Helvetica. White Helvetica on a red hoodie. Robert E. Lee. That's his real name. He walks right up to me. I've been in town two days. I've never met this guy before in my life. He comes up to me and says, Hi, how are you doing? I go, great, I just moved here. Then he proceeded to tell me his story. He had been an itinerant window washer, if there is such a thing, driving from Humboldt Bay to Aberdeen for 30 years, living out of his van, washing windows. Goes up, basically living on barter kind of system. Wash a window at Mari's, you give 20 bucks, I'll be back in three months. <laughs> going up and down the coast. So much to make a movie about this guy. Then he had a stroke, but he said he was lucky because he met uh, you know, a nice woman in Astoria, and he looks at me and he goes, hey, 
You'd retire for a nice piece of ass in that story, wouldn't you? I go, yeah, I would. That's the title of the book. <laughs> Just right there. I mean, it was ridiculous. And then something that I'm very proud of is that all the Study Spit Press books are printed at Pioneer Printing in Newport, Oregon with Dave Shank, who has run that business for 35 years now. And I have a relationship with the person that prints my book. Now, a lot of Oregon publishers don't do this. They, you know, I'm losing 30% doing this, but that's the ethic that I, I was raised with. You spend your money with your friends, not your enemies. You buy local, and it's you talk the talk if you're gonna walk the walk. And I go in there, and there's a real human being putting my book together. Her name is Nikki, and it's a, the, the book buying machine is from Germany, and it's analog, and it was made in 75. It looks like the set of Star Trek, <laughs> and the knobs, and, the, and I just love it. So whenever, look at this, and the readout, okay, 005 down there, and she's working on my book. She hits the green, here they come, and it's like Willy Wonka, okay? <laughs> there's all the rain book. I get to see it. Hold it like books that matter, and then the machine works. Where's the machine? And then it out comes out like something out of the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. <laughs> and it sounds like that. And then here comes the book, and there's a little ding when it comes out. And this is what we do. And it's because I found my inspiration of moving to the ocean and finding the beaches the way they are and the condition they are that Oregon Preserve, that is the most inspiring story. That has been my muse, the ocean and the beach. And it makes me think about what are we doing today to preserve so somebody can come along 40 years from now, 40 years from now, and enjoy. That will enhance that creator's life. I, I don't know. Um, I know many of these people in this community are working hard for watershed protection wild salmonids, you know, in our watersheds. So those things that matter. And, you know, going to the beach and working it all out. <laughs> Thinking about that sort of thing. That's my presentation. Wow. Is there anything you shouldn't do on the beach? Well, with it, of course. Well, uh, some of you may have read that Oregonian article I wrote about the kid from Lincoln City who open carries. You know the open carry faction who carry their assault weapons and, and you know that. He, uh, I ran, I heard the story and I actually interviewed him. He carries three weapons, one of them an assault rifle, uh, when he takes his beach walk. I thought it was absurd, and I wrote as much. <laughs> and um, that's one thing. I've never felt fearful on the Oregon Coast Beach, ever. And one of the great joys, and I wrote about it in this, um, this other book I'm gonna come out, I know these two guys know that. You start a bonfire down at Night Beach, some crazy weirdo's gonna come up to you. That's the joy of it, <laughs> is meeting people from different walks of life, all intersecting on this public space where we're all equal. Um, you know, there's always contention about people letting their dogs run loose on, on the beach. You just need to use common sense with these things. And so there's always a bad dog owner out there. Um, I will tell you though, there is one, there is a great threat looming. 1913, we saved the wet sands area. 67, the dry sands area. But with global warming and elevated sea levels, the erosion is coming. And there is gonna be a fight with beachfront landowners about wanting to extend their footprint with riprap and shore, you know, uh, structures that sort of, you know, try to, you know, stem erosion, that is coming. It's already happening where there's properties that were grandfathered in under the land use laws that 
Now, to protect them, they are moving their riprap seaward into former space that was used by Oregonians at the time memorial to recreate. We need legislation on it. I could write the bill in one, 10 minutes. It's like one sentence. You do not get to extend your riprap footprint one inch westward. Buyer beware, you get to, that, that's it. Because it's happening, it happened down the South Beach where I lived. A landowner had a 419 uh, house built in 48, it's been abandoned, they want to rebuild the structure, raise it to the ground, but they couldn't get a permit from the county because the riprap wasn't geologically sound, it was too close, follow me? So then they got, they went 150 feet. They destroyed the Driftwood Fort put that rip rat in. That means war. <laughs> so that's coming, and we need vigilance on that. That is the great, that is the next battle for the soul of the Oregon coast, is what will happen when the sea levels begin to rise in the next generation, and they are. And what's going to happen in these places? So watch that. That was a long, convoluted answer to that question, but it's all right. Don, Don go ahead. Uh, just a correction, Commissioner Bill Hall will be here on April 12th, Sunday, 2 p.m. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that, Don. Yes? Would you ever consider teaching again? I am teaching. Oh, you are teaching? I am teaching at Astoria High School. I am teaching part-time. Um, I'm teaching freshman English. <laughs> um, and I'm teaching a class called Cre English Credit Recovery. What? English Credit Recovery. Somebody had the great idea of taking every kid who's flunked English and putting them into one class. <laughs> Sophomores through 21-year-old seniors. So I've got those students in there, and it has been a challenge. Um, I was struggling the first few months, but then I had an epiphany, and I actually really enjoy that population. Many of them are young men, and they're just lost. They don't know what to do with this culture. They do not know what to do because they were formerly in a different era, they would have been working in the woods or in the sea. There's just nothing for them to do. They don't want to work on computers, and they, I, don't, I, I fear for them. I'm not sure what's gonna happen, but I'm trying to convey how important writing still is in their life, and that you need to write well no matter what you do. Uh, so it's working, I have a, it's, it's not the same job, but no job is the same. And I learned from teaching long ago that you don't try to recreate the same thing you did well at another school. So, well, we've got an open mic, but I don't have any rock and roll. I don't have any rock and rollers up there in that story. They're all in Newport for some reason. I don't know. So I am teaching again. I enjoy it. I don't know how long I'm going to be going there. It's just like, if I feel good, I'll keep doing it. Any other questions? What a great turnout tonight. It's fine night. Any other last? Yeah. Hi. Your writing is so eloquent in print, what's your best advice for somebody who's a great storyteller that has stories to write? Oh, I, I, this is, I'm going to convey this in three words. This is the secret to writing, and I need this chair for a demonstration. Uh -oh. <laughs> so I get asked this a lot. How do you do it? How do you put the books out? And, well, I live at the coast for one thing. There's no, there's no less distractions. But here is the secret to getting the work done. You remember this? Okay. Watch. Ass to chair. <laughs> so you want to write? You put your ass on the chair and you write. That's it. <laughs> you don't need to take a workshop. You just have to do the work and not watch the movies. Not. You got it. That's it. And I'm not being facetious. And I got that from a famous writer named Richard Rhodes. And it was in his memoir about writing. And he said an old teacher told him that. And he that's been his um, motto his entire career. And it, it, you know you, you have to decide that you want to commit to doing that. And that's all I can say about that. Which is what a lesson for anything in life, right? Music, you know, art, business, anything like that. Thank you, Don, for having me. Thank you, Yahats. Um, just Yahadians? <laughs> yeah, t shirts. Someone's got to make a t shirt. Is there a t shirt there? Join the Yahatians. 
<laughs> Something like that? Okay. Um, I got books for sale over there. Thank you. It's great seeing some, some great friends, you too, especially. Um, be safe tonight. And go build the driftwood fort. Take care.